Hello VC, hello vinyl community. I hope everybody is fine and healthy and safe. Now uh, with this video first um, I have to start with a shout out and this shout out is going to Tavis. Vinyl Talk with Tavis is a uh, VC channel I have discovered not that long ago and um, Tavis is a big expert on soul music and funk music and um, this is kind of the great thing about uh, VC that um, when I come to directions and styles and genres that I'm not too familiar with, you have always your go-to guy uh, on the VC where you can check out uh, the interesting stuff. But um, an hour ago, mm. I was uh, watching a video by Tavis and uh, there he showed his uh, new um, John Hassel record. Now that obviously stroke a chord with me um, because I'm a big John Hassel fan and uh, so I thought I will make a video, a almost like a video reaction to it and uh, just show some of the records uh, from this uh, kind of a musical environment because this was a bit of a discovery for Tavis uh, and I know how amazing and precious those moments are when I, when I suddenly discover a new musical dimension and suddenly these doors jump open and you realize there's this huge fascinating world behind it and um, that's certainly something that uh, has uh, happened to me from time to time and um, it's certainly a crucial part of this whole musical adventure. Now, um, the music of John Hassel is usually called fourth world music, which is a term that he coined. Funny thing is that I have not... I have known this kind of music for quite a while before I knew who John Hassel was. So, because at the beginning of the 90s I discovered a band called Oyukai Conjugate and was totally uh, flabbergasted by their albums and uh, I spent certainly a large time of the 90s listening only to Oyukai Conjugate, not only, but a lot. And um, yeah, their music is very fascinating and it's like this kind of a soundscape journey into foreign mysterious places. And uh, I thought it's incredible this band has basically invented a whole sound of their own uh, that no one else does and um, incredible. I was immediately hooked. So many years later I came across John Hassel basically because um, it, there was an interview with Oyukai Conjugate where they referenced him as certainly a major influence at their, particularly for their early work and uh, so obviously I wanted to know more and uh, started to dig deeper into the work of John Hassel just to realizing oh <laughs> that's where the sound comes from now I understand um, but that is a very classical experience you have if you are exploring um, all kind of musical alleys and all kind of interesting uh, styles, you always figure out that um, regardless how original something feels, it's usually put on the shoulders of someone else. So um, even the greatest music in a sense is always in parts inspired. So uh, I thought I would show some John Hassel records here and now. Um, let me put out the whole stack. So certainly the best way to start is Vernal Equinox, his uh, first record or one of his two first records I think, I'm not entirely sure. Um, this came out 1976 or 7? Uh, yeah 1977 but it was recorded in 75 and in 76. Um, as far as the lore and the mythology goes uh, this was the album that uh, Brian Eno was listening to day and night when he came to New York and to America and uh, which eventually led to a 
collaboration with John Hassel. And uh, certainly a large chunk of uh, Brian Eno's influence uh, comes from John Hassel. Um, so this is already this is already a album that shows this kind of fully developed uh, sound palette that he was creating. Um, so um, as far as I know, he spent quite a lot of time without releasing anything, just trying to figure out his own very personal style. And um, yeah, it's quite obvious that he very much succeeded at that. Um, now, it didn't take long for Brian Eno to track him down, so this was uh, their fruitful collaboration, uh, Possible Musics, the fourth world volume one. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a, this is a re-release that came out on the German label Glitterbeat, quite beautifully done, uh, in a gatefold sleeve. And uh, this is a wonderful record. Obviously, this is probably the most famous John Hassel album. Um, but it's kind of a story that is connected to the album because um, this was originally planned as a John Hassel record produced by Brian Eno. I mean, Brian Eno produced a lot of cool records in those years. And uh, <clears throat> I think somewhere along the way, he suggested to John Hassel that they should put it out as a... John Hassel slash Brian Eno record because uh, it would certainly help John Hassel um, who was not particularly set up well financially as a as a rather starving 70s musician and uh, so the idea was if there is Brian Eno's name on it then uh, it will certainly help the sales which to some extent was probably a good idea because um, this is probably the most uh, well-known album uh, in connection uh, with John Hassel. But for John Hassel it became a bit of a, a weird experience because uh, people kind of started to perceive this as a Brian Eno album. So oftentimes when people list albums by Brian Eno they usually put this one on that list, which is not wrong. I mean, there is Brian Eno all over it. Um, but uh, it would seem that uh, this has caused a bit of a bitterness between those two, to be at least for a short amount of time, um, because uh, John Hassel was a bit annoyed about the fact that uh, people look at this as a Brian Eno album, but obviously, musically speaking, it is far more a John Hassel album with this typical John Hassel sound, um, and it is just quite beautifully produced by Brian Eno with uh, certainly all kind of synthesizer or keyboard work done by Eno and added to it. So, but this is uh, old water under the bridge. I mean, no, one, no one cares about that anymore. Um, it, it certainly didn't lead to any kind of uh, long-lasting animosity between the two. On the contrary, as uh, the following albums would suggest, this is uh, Dream Theory in Malaya, The Fourth World, Volume 2. Um, this is again produced by Brian Eno. And uh, you have the usual ambient gang on it. I mean, you have Michael Brook playing bass here. Daniel Lanois is on this record. So those are, those, this is a group of people that uh, keep appearing on John Hassel's records and Brian Eno's records. Now, this album has also a strong conceptual aspect to it. And uh, you can read it here in the liner notes, where uh, John Hassel is referencing uh, the anthropologist Kilton Stewart, who uh, in 1935 had discovered the highland tribe of the Malayan Aborigines, the Senoi, which have a really an interesting culture, where dreams are basically part of uh, the social cohesion. So. In the morning when people are sitting around the table and uh, drinking tea and um, getting probably ready for doing some work maybe in the fields or whatever um, they are all talking about the dreams they had in the night now i had heard this before because uh, in the 70s and 80s uh, there was a book here in germany um, 
quite popular, I think, which was written by an American uh, psychologist called Patricia Garfield, which was called Creative Dreaming. Um, this was marketed here as a, some kind of an esoteric book, but it's actually not esoteric at all. It's a, it's more a psychological book, and she is talking a lot about um, Kilton Stewart and the Senoi in Malaysia because they are like this ethnological example of a society where dreams are this integral part of uh, their culture, and uh, this is what um, John Hassel has kind of tried to capture in music on this album. Now the next one is probably my favorite John Hassel album, or certainly one of the two or three favorites. Um, this is Power Spot. Again you have the usual gang here playing, Michael Brook uh, playing a guitar and Brian Eno and Richard Horowitz is on here. So this is a wonderful, wonderful record uh, with a very dynamic example of uh, of sort of a tribal fourth world music. Wonderful. This year came out in the same period of time. This is Flesh of the Spirit by John Hassel with Farafina. Now Farafina is a percussion and dance group from Burkina Faso in Africa and um, this is again an amazing record. I can really um, recommend this one. I mean, this is just a joy to listen to this. This came out on Tactile, which is a kind of a sub label again from the Glitter Beat. Um, so um, this came out as this double album. So this is fairly new. Uh, yeah, it's a brilliant record. Um, again, uh, this kind of a classical 80s John Hassel sound. Um, yeah, and finally here, listening to pictures. Um, this is the album that was shown by Tavis. Um, this is quite beautiful and quite fascinating record. At the same time, um, it's a good example that uh, John Hassel is certainly not stuck in time. Um, and uh, continues to push the envelope because uh, this is a really interesting uh, development of his music into completely new directions and uh, and uh, completely new acoustic landscapes and regions. I mean, I would I would even go so far and say that uh, um, if most of his '80s albums were kind of uh, ominous look back in human history, back to somewhat tribal times, um, this is a look into the future. And uh, it's quite interesting because uh, leave it to John Hassel to go a bit against the usual grain. Um, because um, right now a lot of artists kind of try to revive older sound um, to sound, everybody's trying to sound as analog as possible and every, everything's got to be a bit glitchy and a lot of artists are experimenting with uh, old effect machines from the 70s and 80s. But um, this is completely different. This is This feels completely digital from beginning to end, but in a very, very appealing way. Um, it's like it's like listening to music from future. It's like suddenly um, someone was able uh, from the 23rd or 24th century, someone was able just to create a digital file that he was able to send through time uh, by means of a time machine to our time and now you can listen to it. So this is very, very exciting and slightly challenging, but at the same time very fascinating. But um, it's kind of interesting because uh, if this is the first John Hassel album that uh, Tavis has heard, then uh, yeah, that's kind of <laughs> interesting because uh, it's a little bit out there. So uh, even in uh, in terms of John Hassel's music, it's uh, it's a bit of a deviation, or I would rather say a evolution of his music, which is kind of cool because. Uh, Musicians certainly shouldn't keep being stuck in the past, um, despite, regardless what uh, 
the fans want. Now uh, we are not entirely done here because um, there is another aspect of John Hassel and that is uh, his appearance on other records. And uh, so he played here and there. Um, for example, on this album, Remain in Light, Talking Heads. So uh, John Hassel is playing on this one. Um, another example would be his uh, ongoing collaboration with David Sil Sylvian. Here, uh, David Sylvian's uh, first album, Brilliant Trees. Um, John Hassel playing on on this one. Um, yeah, he also played on the album Alchemy, an index of possibilities. Again by David Sylvian. This is quite a wonderful new release. Uh, came out on Virgin, and uh, um, I got this not not so long ago. Um, yeah, so this is another example of guest appearances by John Hassel. Um, anything else? Yeah, he also played on uh, this one here, Passion by Peter Gabriel, the famous soundtrack to The Last Temptation of Christ by Martin Scorsese. Yeah, and uh, oh, and not to forget this one, <laughs> Ambient 4 by Brian Eno, maybe the most important ambient record ever recorded. Um, and uh, guest musician John Hassel. So uh, that's it, and um, this was just my little uh, John Hassel oriented video. And um, I hope everybody's fine and keep it spinning. And greetings to Tavis and goodbye. <laughs>